clearly the theme over the last week and a half is a bit of panic, buying a panic, selling, all of that. New records broken when it comes to volumes and certainly speed of the declines. How did the fear that we saw show up in uh, among your clients, Betterment's clients, and among their portfolios? So I have to admit from where I sit, things went really well. Uh, for better or worse, for a long time now, investors have been buying the dip. Right? Now they come and they see a drawdown of sort of 10%, 15%, and they look at it as an opportunity. This one was no different. Um, on average, what we saw was buying. There was definitely some people who were de-risking their portfolio a little bit, sometimes some moves into a safer cash product. But on balance, what we saw was buying of the dip. More buying than non-action? If, if anything, did people sit on their hands? Yeah, the vast majority of people, I mean, this is true, especially when you look into things like 401k accounts. Yeah. The vast majority of people said, I think I don't want to look. So that makes sense. You, you're basically the face behind the flows into Vanguard this week because <laughs> if you look at your 13F, your top five holdings are all Vanguard ETFs. And I think we have a table here showing that they were all down heavily during the uh, coronavirus week. And look at the flows into them regardless. It's just unusual. It, it's amazing because it was scary. There was a lot of days that were just violent. And the money kept coming in. In fact, Vanguard took in about two, three times their norm. So there must have been some people actually maybe even rebalancing into the equity market. I would say there was a number of things going on from a portfolio management point of view that would add to this. So number one, yes, um, when drift goes up, we ask clients to make deposits so that we can rebalance without selling because mm -hmm. selling would realize taxes. Actually, what we heard most of and the, uh, the thing that was most active in our portfolios was tax loss harvesting. So we had clients writing in. I answered more emails about why am I not tax loss harvesting more than I answered about why is the market going down. What does so that tell you? Uh, it tells me that, number one, we've managed to find a way to make lemonade out of lemons, right? So people now are kind of looking for a positive thing to do while markets are down. And they're not concerned about the market going down. They're looking about at it as an opportunity. And that's a really important switch. That makes them think about things like depositing. And, and you know, I know you, like, you have these psychological, not games, but methods <laughs> that you use. Can you, you know, like where you pop down and it's like, you know you're going to pay taxes on this trade and like no, then nobody does it. Um, you're talking talk about engagement on the Betterment platform. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Okay. Did, did that work this time? Did it, give me like one anecdote about uh, those kind of things that pop up. So one of the things that we consistently see, especially after the market's been going up for a while and then it has a little bit of a dip, uh, people come in and they do look at sort of moving to cash or de-risking. And there is a tax impact preview box that we put up in front of them just to let them know, hey, if you go ahead with this, you are going to end up owing, say, two, three hundred dollars worth of taxes. Um, what we tend to see is that, number one, everybody hates taxes, right? So the odds of you going ahead with it if you owe more than five dollars of taxes is about one in ten. Uh, one of the things we started to look at was how are different people sensitive to different tax burdens when we do this. And what we see is that Democrats are far less sensitive to Republic than Republicans. So if you're from a heavily Republican area, you hate taxes and you're not going to go ahead and realize those capital gains. Interesting, and I'm glad you bring up politics as well, because, of course, Super Tuesday has passed, and we got a big shock, which is that Joe Biden has the momentum here. Do people tend to make portfolio changes based on one candidate moving ahead over another? I think we tend to react to what we see as um, the other party's weaknesses rather than what's going on in our own party. Okay. Uh, we actually had a lot of a really detailed analysis of what happened during the 2016 election. So if you go back there, uh, you think about uh, there was a little bit of an upset by Trump. Um, started out in the beginning of election night, Hillary Clinton was actually ahead. Mm -hmm. That reversed about 9 p.m. if I remember correctly. Um, markets were down overnight. They did. Futures were down about 5% at 1 a.m. or so. And so there was a lot of um, Democrat selling and concern at that point in time. So quite often what we see is not uh, within a party, but across parties, we worry about the negative effects that the other party is going to bring into markets more than our own. Now, you're a, you've been saying a lot that if somebody does ESG investing, they're even more likely not to do anything because they're, you, the fund you pick is ESGU. This is the one that took in a lot of money over January. Um, this owns Chevron and own, owns Exxon. It's kind of like diet, diet, ESG, right? Talk about this kind of a fund versus one that goes after the top 100 ESG scores or something like that. Why'd you pick this one? So I think uh, one of the, the hardest things with ESG is that it's about values. It's about implementing specific values. And different people have different priorities. Um, from our point of view, we want to be able to offer something to as many people as possible, which does mean that you get a very broad-based vanilla approach to ESG. You want to hit as many different facets of ESG as possible. Uh, I think we have an overall framework for looking at balancing different concerns. Mm -hmm. And ESGU is a good fund for basically implementing that for us.